Hello and welcome to the first of our Cup on Tay series, a series of conversations happening in the context of COP26, where we think about and talk about what that means for the arts in Ireland and our creative community. So I'm really delighted for our first panel to be welcoming Shanna Mae Breen, Oshin Byrne, no, oh, Oshin McGraw, sorry, apologies, Julie Griffiths for a conversation about building resilience, what it means in time of emergency. So welcome to you all. If I can ask you to switch on your Oshin McGann, oh my God, I got it. I got your name wrong twice, I apologize. It's nerves, stage fright. <laughs> um, hopefully we will have, Julie as well was with us a moment ago, so I imagine she's having a few technical difficulties and will join when she can. Um, so welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being a part of the conversation today. Thank you for having Thank us. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess maybe we should give uh, our audience a little bit of uh, background on how we all got to know each other. Um, I'm kind of keen to not put anyone on the spot, but I also don't want to be talking the whole time. So <laughs> if either of you want to do the elevator pitch for, for Antenna, the group, um, feel, feel free. Yeah, so Antenna was a group of artists, um, a little collective that formed out of Platform 31, um, which was, um, maybe a few of you know about it, but Platform 31 was something that was born out of COVID and the pandemic, which um, allowed an artist from each county uh, a fund, but also to be part of a, a sort of a, the connectivity tissue of artists from different counties, 31 of us um, overall. I was from Offaly <laughs> um, and through um, Platform 31, a group of us called Antennae joined up um, with, whose um, practices or interests um, involve the climate crisis um, and myself, Ushin and Julie are all part of that group. Thank you. Um, so yes, we we kind of formed pretty organically as artists interested in what working in a climate emergency means, either for how we make our work or why we make our work. Um, and one of the lovely things that has emerged in the conversations we've been having over the last six months is I think all of us are interested in finding the the possibility and the positive and maybe even the joy uh, so I wanted to use that as the starting point for our conversation today especially when some of the headlines you're going to see coming out of COP are very um kind of heavy and uh, can sometimes be fear-based but actually I think inside of the conversation there's always opportunity and possibility to have change be something quite beautiful and radical in a great way as well so I asked uh, these guys to have a think about what gives them hope or what helps them build resilience individually um, in advance of this conversation to be able to share some of those um, uh, ideas with, with you guys. So uh, let me come to you, Oshin. I wanted to, to sort of, I guess, pose that question. What, what is giving you hope at the moment? Where, where does your resilience come from? <laughs> Um, well, one of the things giving me hope is that um, this is becoming a mainstream conversation. It is something that now everybody's talking about when even, you know, five or 10 years ago, it wasn't. Um, and it was going to very much seen as a, a sideline thing. All the scientists will be dealing with that, you know, or somebody can look after it. Um, where I think now there's an acceptance that this is something that's affecting everybody and everybody has a, a certain responsibility or at least um, an interest in helping um, do something about it and um, the I when I was I, I wrote a book about this um, last year and one of the things we did ahead of writing the book um, was to talk to some of the Friday for Futures um, activists and that was actually a question I put to them because you know they were on one hand they were being delivered you know some fairly um, uh, doom laden stuff but on the other hand there was great spirit to the the whole um, the whole exercise and there the one thing that they all had in common was that they found other people to talk to and other people to share it with and i think the more people are involved the more people take an interest the more people there are to share this with and to talk about it to you know and it's the same with when we all got together during um, platform 31 meetings was there was a sense we we did we know we had different views on it we with different reasons for being interested um but we all wanted 
we all felt some kind of duty or some responsibility to do something about it and and to share it you know to kind of to share our feelings about it so um and that's i think that's something that's that's, that's the single biggest support you can have is just the knowledge that other people are out there and, and kind of interested in doing something about it mm. and your work has really focused on I guess uh, on young people, a lot of the the climate work that you've done has been specifically for younger audiences. Do you think that there's something sort of specific or special about the next generation in terms of this conversation, or how does that how does that hit you? Yeah, I mean it's a tricky one. If you're if you're dealing with young people, I mean you're you're very much playing a long game. Um, you know, they're um, particularly in primary school or even secondary school. They don't have power to do things. They don't kind of control their own lives. They're very much kind of governed by their parents and by their schools. Um, <clears throat> so, but you're also trying to reach through them to the people around them as well. Um, so I've been working in schools for a long time um, and doing climate change residencies. And also um, I've done a couple of books last year and doing, I'm working on a resource now. Um, so on, on one hand, I could say, well, whatever I do with them isn't going to do anything in time. Um, but on the other hand, I think a big part of this is the conversation on a broader level. So the more kids are talking about and asking about it, the more um, the adults around them start to take, you know, realize, well, actually, this is, you know, if, if you, there's one thing, you know, about being a parent is that um, you have to make sure the kids are okay. That's your first priority, no matter what else you're doing. So if you're seeing your kids concerned about this and we are I mean it, there's an awful lot of kids who actually they know there's a major problem but they can't define it so they don't understand it very well and they're getting very anxious about it um so that makes the the, the adults around them kind of pay sit up and pay attention because they realize actually you know this is we've got to be doing something about this so um so that's I I always felt like you have to choose your thing you can't do everything and I write for children and, and I illustrate books for children so that's I figured that's where I need to kind of direct my efforts mm. And let me uh, share with everybody how beautiful those books are. And maybe Kate, if it's possible to link to a couple of Oshin's books in the Facebook chat, that would be really cool. Um, can I ask Oshin, what was the piece of work or idea that you wanted to share with the audience that has offered you hope or resilience? Um, well, there were a couple. I kind of, it's hard to decide actually. Um, in looking for something that was specifically um, kind of wanted to make the point. I was looking for a book, I actually read it ages ago. Um, I couldn't find it, so it's stuck up in my attic, but this is the cover. It's um, a Leviathan by um, Philip Hoare. Um, so that was one of the things I want to talk about. And he talks about, it's a book about whales and it, it starts off as a breakdown of Moby Dick um, because he became obsessed with this book. And he was somebody who was, who was frightened of the water when he was young and learned to swim and then became a kind of fanatical sea swimmer. But he goes into, starts off by kind of like, analyzing the book and then starts writing about whales and the environment around the whales and it's it's a very on one hand he he involves a lot of facts but he also talks about it in a very emotional way and one of the things that really struck me when i was reading the book was how he described the ultrasonic pulse of the sperm whale and the fact that you know if you're in the water this stuff is very powerful like if it would deafen you if you were right beside the whale and it used the full force of its pulse but also the fact, so you can feel it when in pulp, when, it, when they send out their pulse, you feel it through your body if you're in the water. And um, he also said, like, they don't just see in two dimensions when they're looking at you using this thing. They, they see the way an ultrasonic scan would see through the body. So they see things not as a surface um, image, but as a kind of a three-dimensional thing with depth. And that was a really profound way of looking at it. I'd never, I, had, I understood the theory before, but I'd never really thought of it that way. And I thought, well, you know, they can, it's like they, scientists wonder, can they see emotions and they can see changes in blood pressure. They can tell if somebody, you know, if, if another creature is pregnant. So all these things, you know, that they can see simply because their sense is different. And all of a sudden this was a really, you know, it made me think of things in a different way. Now, I think anybody who cares about whales is already going to be on board. So it's not like you can convince anybody, you know, all of a sudden, well, now we should care about the environment. But he also talks about the history of whaling. Um, and how whale oil used to be the basis, it was the basis of the Industrial Revolution along with coal. Um, you know, everything from car gearboxes to lamp oil to making margarine, whale oil was used. And it was an industry that was, you know, huge for a while and then died because it's time passed. Mm -hmm. um, and that to me, uh, on one hand, um, 
it's it kind of shows you how how predatory we can be but also how we can change our ways and that's you know they they said they found another fuel that was better that's what saved the whales in the end um but the whaling was also it was the victim of one of the earliest environmental campaigns when somebody dropped a mic into the water and realized that whales sang you know mm. uh, and they could hear their voices for the first time and that was a big um a big factor in the stuff you know the, the environmentalists against whaling um that's such a beautiful but, uh, that's that's one thing anyway so yeah. <laughs> but it's, oh, well, it's i think it's stunning there's so much in there and it actually feels like a really beautiful segue into some of the work that shan has been doing but i want to take this brief moment to just welcome julie to the conversation as well hi, so julie. hi hey julie julie's an artist working Hello, in julie. Julie Gold, uh, and we will come to you next so i'm gonna i'm gonna stay with shanna for the moment um shanna you work in in live art and performance theater and um, I should have just gotten you to say that. I'm still getting <laughs> better at this whole hosting malarkey, but <laughs> bear with me. Um, the thing that came to mind in what, what um, Oshin was saying is how central uh, alternative forms of communication and discovering mm -hmm. the ways that natural sort of systems communicate with one another seems to be an idea that recurs again and again when you sort of start peeling back the layers of this kind of work. So do you want to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, sort of the work that you've done around trees or just give a little bit of a, a hint of the work that you've been making? Yeah, so um, my name's Shanna um, and I um, I suppose in the past year, I've just sort of given myself the title as an environmental artist. I feel like I've done enough homework to kind of feel confident in calling myself that now, which was quite a journey. <laughs> um, but the work that I'm making at the moment currently, um, a lot of it um, is focused around sort of Ireland's biodiversity um, and where we are in the map of sort of um, the great, greater biodiversity of um, Earth and our planet. Um, unfortunately, we're not doing very well on that front. Um, we have the lowest tree cover in Europe at just 11%, with 1% of that being indigenous Irish trees. And our kind of meadow or sort of general biodiversity is in a huge decline as well, which is seeing a lot of extinction of sort of um, insects and um, sort of wildflower species and grasses. So this has really pulled me in. Um, I was reading a lot about it over the last couple of years and um, being artists, this is how we, we make our world intelligible is sort of figuring it out through our art practices so that it's really drawn me in this subject. Um, I've worked on two projects, I suppose, looking specifically at biodiversity in the last two years. 1000 Miniature Meadows, which was a soundscape um, posted out to audiences in the post where they listened to a soundscape about Ireland's biodiversity decline in your gardens or your parks. Um, but it was also a planting project. So the invite was for the participants to plant a meadow themselves. Um, so we had a network of a thousand miniature meadows across Ireland. But I think that's at a about 2,500 now because we repeated the performance afterwards. Um, so that was 1,000 Miniature Meadows. So it had sort of this legacy within the work where we were actually trying to help as well, you know, um, so that we weren't making a work without having sort of a positive impact or a legacy also. Um, and then Root, um, which was my most current project um, as part of Dublin Theatre Festival, looked at um, Ireland's sort of forestry situation um, and uh, created a performance about trees or Irish trees. Um, and as part of that project, we planted 1,000 native Irish trees in my hometown, where I am now in Burr County, Offaly. So I just went on a walk this morning um, around the, the oaks that were very small when we put them in the ground in March, but are growing much bigger. So um, very exciting. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Um, what I might do is come to you now, uh, Julie, and then we'll circle back around and chat through our kind of inspirations because I know you guys have videos that you wanted to share does that sound good great perfect so Julie welcome to our first cop 
chat, cup on tea chat. Um, do you want to give a little bit of an introduction to your work for the audience? Sure. Um, hi, um, my name's Julie Griffiths and um, I live and work in Donegal um, in a small village called Mount Charles. I'm about a kilometre outside of that. Um, and I'm very interested in, um, in the ecology, in ecology, the environment and the rural. Um, and I'm very interested in the rural as a space of um, cultural production um, as an alternative to um, our kind of or urban normative um, way of thinking. I think it's since 2007 that most of the world's population now are urban um, dwellers. And so I, I just am interested in, in what is produced in, in these peripheral spaces. Um, I'm also interested in complexity and particularly in slowness um, as a as a kind of, as a response to an urgent problem, I, I, I think there's um, something intriguing about, about how you apply um, slowness urgently. Um, and yeah, my, my latest work has been focusing on, on snails. So um, looking at, um, yes, yeah, snails as a kind of slim, symbol of sl slowness, um, as a, a sustainable, um, source of protein um, and um, yeah, creating a space, an art space, um, using this as a methodology and a metaphor. So that's me. Fantastic, thank you. Um, yeah, so to those of you watching, I guess having heard each of these artists speaking, you can imagine the richness and diversity of the conversations that we've had over the last six months, and it's been a real pleasure. Um, sort of being a part of Antenna in its earliest days. Um, so yes, I threw out a, a challenge, I suppose, for each of you to, to pick. And like Oshin, I completely appreciate how almost impossible it is. It's like, what's your favorite album? I don't know. Um, but being able to choose even a couple of things that um, we could talk about today uh, that are a lovely invitation and offer to people who are maybe inundated with the negative aspects of climate conversations to realize that, um, you know, once you, once you find your tribe a little bit and feel safe in the conversation, that there's actually a wealth of opportunity in finding something really beautiful and joyful in trying to build a future that we would choose for ourselves. And I think as artists, there's a great, um, proposition in that as well you know imagining a future uh, that we currently won't inherit you know but we could maybe uh, if we start thinking about it now so yeah I guess thinking about what gives you hope what brings joy what builds resilience um Julie I know you sent me through a video would you like we can share that now okay so we will play this is Solastalgia. I knew I was going to say that wrong. Um, and I will just share my screen and do the noodly bits of Zoom. Um, okay. Are we able to see that? Yeah. Yeah. Great. I'll go full screen with it if I can. Excellent. And here you go. Or Julie, before I play, is there anything you'd like to say about the video or why you chose it? Um, I, I guess I need to, to thank Cathy Fitzgerald um, for introducing it to me. Um, I was um, a participant on her eco-literacy course um, and Cathy's working really hard to, to introduce um, uh, kind of a way for all of us to articulate the way that we're feeling about um, this time that we're living through. Um, she has um, an eco-literacy and eco-philosophy course and it is, it's, it's offering a tribe, um, if you like, and you know people who are feeling it the same way and looking for ways to think through these, these issues and problems and articulate them. So, and it just really struck with, it stayed with me after the course. It's addressing, you know, the, the real sort of difficulties and grief of this, but doing it in a really beautiful way. Um, so that's why I chose it. Amazing, thank you. Okay, let's have a look.
the audio coming through for you? I love you where waves shatter sea walls, where pipelines burst into liquid fire, where our only reservoir evaporates into layers of salt and emergency. I love you where winds, hurricanes, bloom acid rain from magnetic clouds breaking levees and flooding cities. I love you where coastlines erode, where habitat thresholds are crossed, where rainforests turn to ash. I love you where my passion unravels your invisible ecologies unleashes the romance and hierarchy of survival. Our last and permanent address. I don't love you as if you were rare earth metals, diamonds, or reserves of crude oil that propagate war. I love you as one loves most vulnerable things, urgently, between the habitat and its loss. I love you as the seed that doesn't sprout, but carries the heritage of our roots, secured within a vault. And thanks to your love, the organic taste that ripens from the fruit lives sweetly on my tongue. I love you without knowing how or when the world will end. I love you naturally, without pesticides or pills. I love you like this, because we won't survive any other way, except in this form, in which humans and nature are kin, so close that your emissions of carbon are mine, so close that your sea rises with my heat. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd love to open it out for a little bit of a chat to see what resonated with you guys coming out of that. If anything. 
I, I was talking to Kathy about the, the fact that I was going to share it today, and she was um, saying about mentioning um, not only the word solastalgia, but also um, solis, solifilia, um, which is just uh, more to do with the sense of love um, rather than the sense of grief. Um, so that it, it, you know, we're talking in kind of positive and hopeful terms about this. Um, that, um, yeah, that uh, that sense of um, of care that's induced by um, being in the environment. Mm. Well, the refrain and through the entire poem, the I love you definitely carries that through. And just for anybody watching who hasn't furiously Googled what solastalgia is, it's um, the grief of a lost environment. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful piece. I love the line, when humans and nature are kin. Yeah. I guess there are some ideas that keep on grabbing me and it, uh, it feels really resonant, that idea of um, how much we learn when we do slow down and when we do see the human species inside of the natural um, world as opposed to sitting outside or above um, all living things, that we are one in this huge cacophony of nature. Yeah, I was listening to something recently and it was saying that indigenous peoples, uh, um, some indigenous people don't have a word for the environment or for nature because because it's it is everything. So it's not us as separate from um, all of that. It is we are part of all of that. And so it doesn't require expression. Um, it mm. just... I think it's it's beautiful as well, Julie, because it is the idea of slowness or slowing, slowing down is so much part of that connectivity or how to connect. I was speaking with um, someone in Phoenix Park recently who looks after um, a lot of the wildlife there and he used the expression to get getting your eye in. Um, so if we slow down enough, you start to see, literally you start to see things that you wouldn't if, you, if we were living our fast paced life. Um, so it's really interesting about this idea of slowness and getting your eye in and um, time and also living in the city and the natural rhythm, what, where, how I feel when I come back to Offaly versus when I'm in the city. I live in two different rhythms um, and I wonder if I brought my Offaly rith rhythm to St. Stephen's Green, what would happen? <laughs> what what um, nature would I see of humans and of nature itself? <laughs> one of the, the points I'll often try and make throughout the sessions I do for kids is that there's no dividing line between us and nature you know they'll often think of and, and people generally will think of you know the environment as well that's trees or there's a river out there or main, mountains or you're kind of going well actually you're breathing in the air like the environment is your life support system and um, so one example I give is I, I have when I'm doing my Zoom talks I have a log um, and I will say that this is made out of the air. You know, this, it's not entirely made out of the air, but it's 40% carbon. Um, a carbon gets, uh, trees get their carbon from the carbon dioxide in the air and we breathe out carbon dioxide. So your breath could be part of some tree somewhere. And that most of the bulk of a tree, like even the oldest gnarliest tree you've ever seen was drawn from the oxygen, drawn from the carbon dioxide and, and the air around it. Um, and I keep we'll keep coming back to this idea that there's there's no part of our lives that doesn't connect us to nature. I mean, we're we're all staring at computer screens, but all the materials that make these screen came from the earth. Mm. Um, you know, every aspect of our life has threads back into the environment, um, and you know we are completely immersed in it. You know, even if we sat here doing nothing, we'd be changing the chemical composition of the air. Uh, so. And I think the film captured it very well, this kind of thing of being, you know, being immersed in it, that it is always there. We're always touching it, you know, we're always involved with it. Um, because I think sometimes we feel insulated from it and that, you know, what we do isn't natural because we have televisions and cars and all that kind of stuff and going, yeah, but this is all still in nature. It's all still kind of having an effect and it's having an effect on us. So, um, and I tie that in with storytelling because I, I do my school residencies through storytelling. I say, yeah, but your characters and environment can never be separated from each other. They always have an effect on each other, whether you, you're talking about where you grew up or whether you, you come to a new place, um, it will always affect the course of the story. 
the place around the characters. Mm. I really love that observation. Yeah, it's it's an amazingly kind of rich film because it kind of brings up a lot of different ideas. I think, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm one note, but I feel like one of the best expressions of the fact that we are of nature is that we're so hard, hardwired to connect uh, to each other and to form community. And that, that, as Shanna says, has been distracted or augmented by technology. So we connect and we form community in different ways now. But I think that the, the impulse and the instinct is so human. Uh, and it's, it's the thing that you find in all other species is these, these communities, these connections that form between people and between plants and animals. Um, we've had a comment in from Kathy Fitzgerald, who I think is your friend, Julie, <laughs> um, saying thanks so much, Julie, and wanting to acknowledge that these words, solastalgia and sol solophilia, um, are new words developed by an Australian farmer philosopher. I would love that title. What an amazing <laughs> job. Glenn Albrecht. And he has a book called Earth Emotions, and he works with indigenous ab Aborigines, which I think is something, again, that is a repeated refrain. The more you um, involve yourself in the climate conversation, the more it brings you back to indigenous wisdom and, and folklore in an Irish context. And just the, the, I guess, inherited understanding of natural rhythms that seem more protected within indigenous cultures. Um, Thank you for that, Cathy. Um, she also recommending courses on eco-literacy that Julie mentioned, uh, which you can find at www.haumea.ie. So thank you for joining the conversation. If anybody else has any comments or questions, you can pop them into Facebook chat and we will get them here in Zoom. Um, thank you. So we might move to your video, Shanna, now, unless there's any final thoughts on that beautiful film. Cool, great. Uh, would you like, while I'm doing my Zoom noodling, uh, to yeah. give us a bit of a description of why you chose this piece? Yes, I chose this piece. Um, I researched it specifically for this. Um, I, Whenever I'm asked to talk about other artworks or, what, or what's of inspiration, I always find new ones because I feel like I repeat the same ones over and over again. So this is actually a new work for me as well um, that I found that occurred in 2016 by artist Mary Mattingly. Um, and it's called Swale um, and it's sort of a piece of uh, a sort of activism art um, in New York in the Bronx um, and it talks about food deserts and places where communities um, in, in America or across the globe don't have access to fresh food fresh food and veg um, so it's kind of looking at um, sort of the industry around food and sort of the impact that that's having on communities but also um, yeah environmentally what's the impact of that so um, the video will will go on and explain further great thank you okay let's play that's good. Mm. Try some of this one. Edible you flower. Need the flower? Mm. One of our favorites. It's produced very well here on board. Let's try some. Right now in New York City, almost all of our food comes from outside. It's not as fresh because of that, and it's much more expensive. We also have the output, so all of the garbage that's created from the packaging of this food coming into the city. So it started with an idea, you know, what if like clean water is a human right? What if food could be that way too? And what could a city like New York look like and how could it function if that um, was the case here? That was kind of the thinking behind doing swale was that if we could if we could do the space on the water we could travel from place to place where we were in the south bronx is definitely considered the biggest food desert in the united states 
Mary, she pointed out to us, um, it's illegal to grow fruits and vegetables in public parks. There's no laws about growing vegetables and fruits and herbs on the water. So we found a loophole <laughs> to get around. <laughs> Swale was an interesting kind of provocation. Of course, New York City's not going to feed itself from one floating barge, but she can capture the imagination of individuals that visit, of kids telling them, yes, you're allowed to pick this food. What conversation do you want to start? Have you ever planted any fruits or vegetables? Do you eat fresh fruits and vegetables? What if these kinds of spaces could be available in our public parks here in New York City? How we use urban land. What if our systems of food supply and distribution looked a little bit different? Mm. People will start to care about the plants on soil, and then they'll start to care about the soil and then they start to care about the water. All those things, they end up coming up when we think about picking food ourselves. It really matters that we get together and work together on things that can be bigger than what we can do on our own. Our cities face many different kinds of crises. We have the crises of aging infrastructure, of affordability, of climate change. We need government policies, we need scientific inquiry, but we also need creative exploration of how we frame and understand and talk about those problems. That's, I think, what helps us envision new futures. I don't know what it's going to be like here in the future. I don't imagine that it's going to be any easier than it is now. It's pretty hard now, so there's something that sadly is utopian about this and it's utopian because we're in a time where it feels like it's such a stretch to have food considered a right or a service or public so that's maybe dystopic too So that was that was swale and um what i found out afterwards so it happened in 2016 but this sort of community project actually did impact a lot of sort of policies around being able to grow food in the bronx since that point mm -hmm. um and the barge itself is becoming a permanent garden and there will be more like more like them in the area so that video was made before when they talk about the imagination of what uh, this sort of um, future could look like, maybe it is a bit celebratory, but actually the result of it was that it was a celebration, but it was also listened to and has created a, an impact um, for, for um, yeah, people in the Bronx and that community. So it, I, I loved it. <laughs> this is, is really interesting because I was reading, I've, I've only heard the word swale recently, um, but I was yeah. reading another, other projects where they're not they're basically any depression with a kind of low wall around it um and um in some cities they're starting to use them as both as kind of a way of growing stuff in the middle of a street um but also as a form of drainage so they like you have a large section of this in the middle of a road or on the edge of a road by a path um and they can be used they, they actually have a number of functions so part of it they can drain floods um, help drain floods. They also can be used as a good separator between cycle paths and the roads. They're very safe because they're a nice high barrier. Um, so they like they, it's the kind of thing you kind of go, we should have these, you know, everywhere should have these. And the idea that you can, can grow vegetables, and you wouldn't be growing vegetables next to a road if you want to eat them. Um, but the idea that we kind of basically automatically include these things as part of our infrastructure really makes a lot of sense. Um, and certainly in terms of dealing with the effects of climate change and, and possible flooding or shade, you know, against the sun. Um, these things kind of really do make sense in terms of long-term planning for urban environments. 
Um, it's interesting because one of the, uh, I, I was going to mention, it's not, it's not a piece of art, but um, one of the things that really gives me hope or has given me hope recently um, is the idea of regenerative farming. And one talk in particular, now there's been, a, there's a few versions of the talk, but the full one is two hours long. Um, I often will be kind of, you know, I'll be doing the kitchen or something and put something on that I can listen to while I'm working. Um, but it's a guy called, well, one of the guys that, who's kind of most notable for it is a guy called Walter Jenna, and he talks about the soil carbon sponge. And it's, it's remarkable um, stuff. It's, it's basically about regenerating, using um, farming to regenerate the soils, um, working more kind of with um, rewilding land, but also working in a way that kind of rebuilds the soil up and the soil absorbs carbon. And we often, we always talk about carbon dioxide as being the, the gas that we have to watch in terms of climate change, but actually the, the one that has the biggest effect is water vapor. Um, but we don't talk about water vapor because there's so much of it. We have no, we feel we have no control over it, but actually the soils and the way the water cycle works through soil um, has a really powerful effect on the environment um, and on the climate. So, um, in fact, one of the reasons the carbon dioxide is so important is, is it's one of the things that regulates water vapor in the atmosphere. Um, so there's, there are different versions of this talk, but the, like I said, the full one's two hours long, but it's basically talking about the, the relationship between fungi, the aggregate from the ground that carries the minerals, and the carbon, basically the stuff that makes the living, the dead stuff in the soil that makes it soil, that makes it growable. Mm. Um, and it really kind of gets back to the basics in terms of how, you know, how it helps, you know, it's important for the food, obviously, but it's also important with the, the cycle from carbon and water and, and how they work through the air and back into the ground again. Um, I'll put the, I'll put the link up on the, the chat, but um, it's just really because, he, you know, to listen to, to him talk about it, it's one of the single most powerful things we can do in terms of kind of regulating the environment. And it's, it's, it helps us grow food and it makes for better landscapes and um, prevents desertification. I mean, it's every, we, we should do it for every reason. Um, and it's, it's something that's very possible to do. And it kind of really, I, I'd, I'd written, I had a book, I have a book um, Short Hope Will Guide for Climate Change, which I'll show you. Um, and I'd written this and it was out. And then I heard about this. And I thought I talked about regenerative farming, but I hadn't talked about this. And I thought, oh, why didn't I know just a few months earlier? Um, so it's well worth checking out. For a sequel, though, Oshin. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, my my sure. own encounters with swales was was as flood defence and as urban design. Um, so it's interesting. I think Ireland, you know, with our abundance of water and rain, uh, have not been the best at thinking about it as an asset. Um, so that's one of the things that I find a lot of possibility and hope in, you know, rainwater capture, how we can redesign spaces to be more sympathetic to both, you know, the needs of the humans and, um, and their nature, nature kin. And um, I wonder as well, because the video was, was a really beautiful example of the challenges of urban ecology and the kind of the emotional space that that conjures for people. And it seems like it might might grow from an experience like uh, being in in a place like Donegal, Julie, where you have an abundance of um, natural space around you. Do you think that there's any kind of creative exchange happening in in terms of how people think about nature in in urban settings versus in rural settings? Um, I, I know that I just completed a series of workshops with women all around the county of Donegal, um, and we were talking about women's experience through um, through the lockdown, and so many women um, talked about finding, you know, finding solace in in the natural environment, um, and just intuitively going there to, you know, to find a safe space and a space for thinking and a space for processing everything that we've been living through. So I, I think definitely there is there's a recognition there that you know that. that that this is of vital importance and that, that we need to cherish it and um, that the people who live here know how how important it is um, and I, I think we're sort of looking for the Thunbergs of the world to to unite behind in, in order to um, to you know address and take action um, I think everybody's just waiting to for for a banner to to walk behind <gasps> What a beautiful segue you have given me, Julie, <laughs> Julie Griffiths. It's almost that like we practice this, we do not. Um, 
there will be a banner for you all to march behind this coming Saturday, the 6th of November. Um, there is a march in various cities across the country and we will be hosting an artist block and arts block um, in the march in Dublin, which is going to be gathering at the Garden of Remembrance at noon. So we will have a giant banner that says artists united behind the science. Please come and join us. Be a part of a really important moment because I guess Cup on Tay exists as a creative conversation responding to COP26 happening in Glasgow right now. And it's an opportunity to demonstrate to our government and our local politicians how crucial and critical we feel the conversation around climate and climate justice is. So this is a march for climate justice and it will be feet on the ground to demonstrate how important we find these challenges to be. I mean, it's the challenge, right? It's existential and it doesn't belong just to us. It belongs to our children and their children. Um, and one of the things that struck me the other day, which is kind of terrifying and also hopeful, potentially, um, I began working really directly on climate as a theme in my own work about six years ago and I didn't consciously put two and two together but it was a response to the birth of my first niece um, and realizing that the future suddenly felt like a dangerous inheritance for her um, and the point we set at now in terms of the carbon budget left for the entire world is another six years. So I'm at a midpoint where I look at my niece and I know that when she turns 12 in six years time we will be in a completely different position. And I think now is the point for urgent engagement. So the urgency is to be a part of the conversation, find your community, form the connections, and then the slowness and the gentleness and the beauty in the offer we can find as artists is that it's often about reconnecting with nature. And there's nothing punishing in that for anybody there's no that's not about doing without or doing with less of or you know once you once you kind of reconnect with nature uh, in that really important way all of the other levers seem to just click through on their own a little bit easier so that's a bit of a monologue i would love for um kate if you're able to link to a few more details about the march and a few more details about our incredible panelists thank you once more Shanna May Breen, Oshin McGann and Julie Griffiths for joining us in this inaugural conversation for Cup on Tay. There will be three more conversations happening and you can find out more about the details of those chats on the Access website or, or on any of the Access uh, social media. So thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I able to stop the streaming? <laughs>